Good afternoon, I'm, uh, and welcome to City Conversations. I'm Michael Alexander, the uh, director of uh, SFU City Conversations. We're presented by SFU Public Square, and we want to thank our sponsors, SFU Vancouver, Bing Tom Architects, and the SFU City Program. Today's special conversation is presented with the generous assistance of the Vancouver City Planning Commission. I want to acknowledge the uh, members of the Planning Commission, if you uh, wait, folks uh, who have really helped with this uh, uh, with this event. This is for those of you who haven't been here. Why am I? First of all, why am I not surprised that this room is full today? Uh, but for those of you who haven't been here before, this is just, you know, these rooms are impossibly formal. They're going to be renovated uh, next year and hopefully in a much less formal uh, manner. But uh, uh, they're set up for lectures. We don't do lectures. We have conversations here. Uh, so we don't have speakers and we don't have an audience. We have presenters and we have participants. And you are the participants. Um, the presenters are just going to briefly frame the conversation. Seven minutes, no more for each, uh, for each one. Then it's going to be your turn to ask questions, to uh, give opinions, to make observations. Uh, we've got a big room today, full room. Uh, so. Uh, please, when you uh, when you all call on people as you raise your hands, uh, keep it short uh, uh, so that we can get as many of uh, questions and uh, comments in as possible. But the point is, we want to encourage conversation. Anybody who brought your lunch, thank you so much. It is not rude to eat your lunch at City Conversations. We know that you have busy lives and uh, multitasking is encouraged here. If you're tweeting, it's at CityCon. Um, and today's topic, does Vancouver need a citywide plan? The basic layout of Vancouver streets, neighborhoods, schools, parks, and infrastructure dates from 1929. That plan was the foundation for many local area and community plans, transportation plans, and zoning maps identifying what could be built and where it could be built. After more than half a century of growth and change and with extensive public process in 1995, council adopted City Plan 95, a 20-year framework for subsequent community and other planning programs. Does that need an update? What would be the benefits of a new citywide plan that defines where growth would take place and what kind of growth should take place? What might that pro process look like and what hazards would it face? Today we are deeply honored to have with us Ann McAfee, who's <laughs> behind the computer, sorry who was Vancouver's co-director of planning and who guided the 1995 city plan, along with uh, her co-director of, of planning, Larry Beasley, who's in, uh, in the, uh, uh, has joined us today, and we're very pleased to see Larry. Uh, Patrick Condon is uh, the chair of, of urban design at UBC School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. And Peter Whitelaw is a principal at the planning group MODIS, and is very experienced in creating and updating plans for other BC communities so that we can learn from them as well. So we'll start. Um, and I think you said that you, uh, we're going to start first. Hi, thank you. Any one of the audience could probably give this talk since many of you have lived it. Does Vancouver need a new citywide plan? Yes, simple answer. There's two questions. What's going to be the content? Do we use existing plans or do we come up with new plans? Or the question is, who's going to be involved? Is it going to be staff going and writing a draft plan or is it going to be the community doing a city plan times two engagement? I would argue that Vancouver's got a lot of strategic directions. Many of them have been there since the 1970s. They probably need to be wordsmithed but they certainly don't necessarily need to be rethought. 
And indeed, if I was putting together the city's plan today, we've got a lot of chapters that already exist. It's just that people like myself, when I was director of plan, uh, city plans, screwed up. I got so excited with the staff and the community and doing all these plans, we never actually put them together. So they're all sitting out there. Many of them have been updated over the last few years. We've got land use, which has excess zoning capacity, hard for the public to figure out where it is and what it is. We've got central area plans, which Larry was involved with. And over the last decade, we've had area plans done for almost every community. We're not short of plans. The difficulty is that the only place you can find them together is the regional context statement, and that's not really written for people who want to look at Vancouver's plan. So in terms of options for a new plan, I definitely build on existing plans. I would involve multi-stakeholders. Might not go as far as city plan in terms of participation. I would not, however, if I was a council member, tell staff to go away and do a draft plan for public input. Because in the old days, you might have been able to get away with that. But we all know you can't today. The public has a right to be involved in their own community. I would suggest that the Community Visions Program identified a lot of centers for future development. I think there's been a tendency over the last few years for councils to forget anything happened before they got into office. But indeed, when you look at city plan, the variety of people who are involved, with almost 100,000 being engaged, I would be out there reminding those folks that they have been part of a process, that their various discussions around increasing housing and where it would happen, and their discussions around services and who pays, and the, which all ended up in city plan, where surprisingly, as one of the conclusions, about 80% supported increasing housing choice in existing neighborhoods provided growth paid for new services. So we had city plan. A lot of citywide policy came out of that. We had area plans. But the neighborhood center program really never got off the ground. The first neighborhood center happened with the community developing new housing forms, developers looking at and discussing with the community what the options were, and indeed the community getting very involved in looking at ways to exchange density for, in this case, a new food store and a new library. When the neighborhood center for Knight and Kingsway went to public hearing, many people didn't even hear about it or know it happened. Because when the public hearing happened, the community said, vote for the plan. There were no protests because it was the community's plan. And I think, to some extent, that left some people feeling that nothing was happening. Indeed, if you look at Knight and Kingsway today, a lot's been happening. And an interesting article recently was written by Pete McMartin about what happened in the Knight and Kingsway area. So what I would do if I was putting together a new city plan, I would assemble and review the existing policies. I'd encourage the public to come back out and look at the various neighborhood centers identified in community visions. I'd have the menu of different kinds of housing options which were invented in Knight and Kingsway and have been worked on and improved since then. And I would engage the communities in looking at what kind of improvements can happen in the neighborhood using some of the DCL, CAC money to accompany new zoning with new opportunities for services. There's an old saying, uh, there's Chinese proverb, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me I understand. That actually is great, although I must say from recent experience, tell me I reject is more likely to happen, show me I'll show you, <laughs> and 
involve me, I support maybe the directions that need to be put together to create a new and updated citywide plan. Patrick, I think. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And just uh, to start off with, uh, I agree with 95% of what Anne has said, and that's always the case with Anne. Uh, it's the 5% that I'm going to somewhat artificially uh, and hopefully provocatively uh, emphasize. And I'll start off by saying uh, city plan, a great plan, and uh, you said it yourself, it didn't actually lead to a plan. I think we've uh, thought we've had a plan, but we don't have a plan. I think the average citizen in Vancouver doesn't know they don't have a plan. And uh, as I've written, uh, we're the only municipality in the region that doesn't have a plan because the other municipalities are required to conform to provincial legislation, which leads to the production of an official community plan. We're exempted from that because we're a charter city. So um, I've become somewhat how does this click in? Oh, down. <laughs> I've become somewhat uh, better at moving through slides quickly, and uh, for an academic, that's quite an achievement. So I'm going to uh, flash through some to give some suggestions about what a plan might look like based on my experience. This is one we worked with the city of North Vancouver, uh, as you know, organized around Lonsdale Street. And basically agreeing with Anne, uh, we've done a lot of work and we think it's possible to do a plan for a city. Uh, we've done it a few times, not for Vancouver, but for North Vancouver, for Surrey, in uh, not a long time. Uh, the actual community engagement can be relatively quick. It uh, requires a careful process, of course. It doesn't happen at the drawing table with a, without a whole lot of work being done in advance, such as this diagram for North Vancouver. And this set of goals and principles and objectives that inform the North Vancouver charrette. This is very typical and looks a lot like many of the documents that came out of our own Vancouver City Plan can be backed up now in our contemporary circumstances by a desire for uh, meeting sustainability objectives. This was the energy targets for the city of North Vancouver. <coughs> and has to be drawn from an actual understanding of the site itself. So this is a parcel by parcel estimation of what the energy use was, depending on where you lived in that city. <coughs> and essentialized and abstracted and put into a, a map of how neighborhoods performed, somewhat different than how places <coughs> performed. With that as a grounding, a charrette, in this case, in, in the city of North Vancouver, was executed in a number of days with stakeholders there, and showing where the new buildings would be necessary to triple the population of that city, triple the population <coughs> of that city. Uh, you would think people would go completely nuts, uh, but they didn't because we told them it's a 2050 plan, so you're all going to be dead anyway, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, and uh, visuals are very important in all of this, so when people are being asked to accept a plan, they have to, it has to be in a language they understand, which of course is how does it look now, how would it look in 15 years, and how would it look in 50 years as it comes online. By the way, those of you who think I'm anti-tower, this is evidence that I'm not always, that's not always the case. Uh, but more importantly, in terms of the broad area of the city, how do neighborhoods change? And drawing up what those gradual evolutionary changes might be, and how that would be inserted into the fabric of neighborhoods. Again, specific drawings of a specific proposal that can be turned into a zoning map that goes as far as understanding what building typologies are like. What, bi what business typologies are like, and how one-story businesses can become three-story businesses showing models. How green infrastructure can be incorporated as part of a city plan, rather than an add-on later on as a matter of policy. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the green city plan in terms of wanting to do 100,000 trees, but it's basically for what? What is the, you know, what is, 
really the objective of that and how does that fit into your idea about how neighborhoods fit together. And if you want bikeways, we got bikeways, right? Because this is a suggestion that in the city of North Vancouver, every other street could be turned into a green street. At that level of detail, you can see the green bands and you can see the amendments in the houses. As well as at the broad scale, how, do the, how do the, does the new energy infrastructure operate? Specifically, where is it relative to your greenhouse gas objectives and your objectives to reduce energy? So back to the plan, uh, then into what are the neighborhoods that uh, correlate with that plan, and then uh, looking at what the status quo is in terms of energy use, and what does it turn into. Obviously, the greener it is, the better its performance. A plan is necessary to understand that and to get your arms around where the district heating system would go and how you would shift auto trips to bus trips and biking and walking. And at the end of the day, that's the calculation on the right-hand side. Uh, that was a 100-year plan, and the objective was to get to zero greenhouse gas. So there you go. Uh, once you've reduced it by 80%, which didn't turn out to be all that difficult, uh, with changing in building typologies gradually and ex extending the, uh, the uh, uh, district heating system, adding on the additional on-site <coughs> infrastructure for the additional 20% was not that difficult. So the remaining minute that I have, there's another situation out here which pertains to our question, and that's the places that do official community plans. And I want to turn your attention to Surrey's draft official community plan, which is before the council as we speak. It's a highly detailed uh, instrument, more, and as Anne's pointed out, it is a vehicle that is comprehensive and that alludes to their other plans, but also incorporates those main points from those other plans. Uh, it's very much about land use, about designating what can happen where in somewhat boring planarly terms on some pages, but in explicit diagrams on others. And even goes so far as to show how their, the fabric of their community can evolve over time. So that a cul-de-sac, which is on the left, uh, shown on the, on the right, uh, could evolve in time. So I'll just show one or two more examples from this before I turn it over to Peter. And even to the level of figuring out you know, how the street infrastructure will change. So I think that's enough. I'll leave it at that and uh, turn, it, turn it back to you, Michael, for Peter to get a shot at. There's lots more opportunity to add uh, to add to uh, the conversation as we get into the conversation. Peter, you're on. Thanks, Michael. So uh, I've done most of my work outside of Vancouver. Um, with the exception of looking at local area planning in Vancouver and how to tweak and improve it. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to take a completely different approach in my slides to either Anne or Patrick, so just for a variety. Uh, I do want to start by defining planning. For me, planning is about making decisions about the future, um, where we want to go, and how we get there. And in this case, we're talking about a plan that shapes decisions about growth, across the whole city, where it should go, what it should look like, and what process to use later on to define the details that we can't define in this big, broad plan. The second thing I thought that would be helpful uh, to focus my thoughts was to think about what the problems are that we're trying to solve with the new plan. And um, I think the first thing is that Vancouver has really shifted gears in the last few years from big development projects on big sites with almost nobody living next to them into uh, development right in neighborhoods. And the momentum that, that, that development has had has been brought to bear on those neighborhoods. And I think some of them feel a little bit like they've been hit by a moving train. Um, along with that, we've got a very visionary and leading council. And their interest in hitting big issues at the time, taking leadership on those, has led, I think, to some people again not being uh, felt that, that they've been heard. So uh, that's been an issue, and again, it feels a bit like they've been railroaded. Um, adding to these points, the scale of development is quite high, the negotiated approach for rezonings, 
uh, is a big potential for conflict of interest. Um, and a lot of city resources, I understand, have been focused more on the big sites than on the small spaces. So uh, there's a sense of maybe favoritism. Um, and the last thing that I've certainly noticed is that even at the neighborhood plan scale, there are rarely enough specifics to deal with some of those big issues of form and height and density, which have been really key. So all of these things have built some level of distrust in the democratic process and the process that people have to engage in making those decisions about the future. What does experience elsewhere tell us about what to expect from citywide planning? Um, we'll solve these problems. To me, I think it has some potential, but it's certainly not a silver bullet. Uh, <clears throat> citywide plans can be valuable. And as, plan, as uh, Patrick has pointed out, uh, places like North Vancouver and, and Surrey have been quite successful, but they can as easily be a waste of time. Um, communities with OCPs have many of the same issues that Vancouver does in terms of dealing with site-by-site -site, uh, developments, rezonings, uh, major changes, and they often have to come back and revise their official community plans as new projects come forward. Um, the second thing for me is that comprehensive plans help you with the first part of the conversation of dealing with those big issues, maybe of energy and so on at the scale that Patrick's talking about. Um, but they don't necessarily help you deal with the specific details at the street level. Um, some of them do that better than others. So what it means is you need more detail at the neighborhood plans, uh, neighborhood level, and you're going to end up with more rezoning processes, maybe less than you do in Vancouver's current state. You still need more, um, and partly because you can't anticipate everything when you do the plan. Um, the last thing I'd, I'd point out um, is that another plan actually can add more complexity to what's already a complex system of plans. And while uh, it's possible to bring in, in the high-level policy from other specific plans like a transportation or a housing plan into your official community plan, it does then mean that when you go and update those other plans, you have to consider how all the different pieces align. So adding the extra piece can be helpful, it can give you that one-stop shop where you can see all the pieces and, and get a handle on it, but it can also make it a bit more difficult in terms of finding different pieces and making sure that they all make sense together. So, if we embark on a citywide planning process, what should we consider? Um, first of all, a key thing is balancing flexibility and, and rigidity in the plan. It's important to be fairly certain so people know what's coming at them, uh, but you can't anticipate everything. You've got to be flexible. The second piece uh, is really about alignment with those various different uh, specific thematic plans and even with some of the neighborhood plans. So you've got to make it fit like a glove with the other parts of how the city works. Um, the third piece here is really about political commitment and community support. You have to have those pieces in place. And I've seen lots of communities where their official community plans sit by the wayside as uh, the politicians continue with what they prefer to do, despite all of the policy that's in place. Um, and community and staff support is equally important, actually. If you have a strong community and staff support for your plan, um, as you were pointing out, A, it gets approved. B, the politicians have a really tough time saying no to something that the community supports. So that <coughs> constituency is critical. Um, and the last piece down here is about resources for implementation. If you have a plan, you can have the most fantastic plan in the world, but if you don't have the staff and the funding to support the implementation of that through regulations or through programs, uh, it doesn't go anywhere. And I've certainly been part of processes where we've produced great plans, uh, and I've watched staff get cut by 10 or even 20% and literally be incapable of delivering on the promise of the plan. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things that make the planning process effective. Uh, the first one is that a plan should develop and effectively communicate a shared vision for the future. And that's a real challenge. I think we're actually rarely successful at this. And I think it may be a bit more of a mythical beast like a unicorn than something we can actually achieve. What we're more likely to achieve is a vision that reflects a lot of input but that doesn't necessarily resolve the real internal conflicts within a community. So we end up with something that is actually a real creature, the opaki, 
which looks like a combination of a giraffe, a horse, and a zebra. Um, the last thing is that a planning process has to ask and answer the really tough questions. This is a thing that Vancouver, like every other city, is challenged with. How do we go out and take incredible leadership on greenhouse gases, on homelessness, on affordable housing, parks, and so on, and at the same time uh, talk about stuff that we would really like to have? Uh, someone, maybe Gordon Price, maybe someone else once said to me that people in Vancouver would really like a $30,000 house on an acre property in Point Grey overlooking the ocean. <laughs> it's true, and you just can't have it. So uh, a planning process isn't helped by having rose-colored glasses. You have to have trustworthy and productive dialogue that draws out the issues and faces them ahead on. And a, little, uh, a last point on that is the images that Patrick showed that actually take all of these policy ideas, coalesce them in something that actually looks like a building, um, and helps you to understand what that looks like and feels like is a way that you can make these big issues and bring them home and make them real to people. And those kinds of visuals, the visual processes like charrettes, are critical to success in a plan like this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to start this process. Uh, this long conversation that there is to be a city plan informally and today. Uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your uh, hands. Uh, there are going to be uh, bunches of people, so I'm going to uh, call you by number because otherwise I'll lose track of you. Um, and before we do uh, start, I want to, uh, I see uh, 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 Councillor Adrian Carr in the uh, audience. Thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations on your re-election. And I want to acknowledge uh, uh, your presence today. Thank you. Uh, start with hands, please. Two, I'll, I'll just give a number so that I'll, I'll remember. Yeah. Three, four. Okay. Yeah, but just the modest presentation mentioned uh, mentioned uh, resilient processes um, in reference to planning. So I'm interested in uh, just maybe hear you talk a little bit more about what resilience means in terms of the process, and perhaps a little bit more about what resilience might mean in terms of um, a resilient city plan. What what that implied for a city plan, um, perhaps in the context of um, like a, a post-disaster kind of scenario. Um, so it's probably about three questions in there, but basically revolving around the term resilience, I, I seem to see it cropping up more and more in the uh, academic discourse. Sure. Um, if I used the word resilience, it was a mistake, actually. I, I find it to be painful term in many ways. But um, that aside, I think the key issue for plans is, is that balance between certainty and flexibility. And especially with a community-wide plan done at most for 10 years, and more often every 15 to 20. And the city plan, it would be at least 20. So over that time scale, you can't possibly anticipate everything that's going to happen. I, I think uh, an interesting thing that plans can sometimes do is actually build um, explicitly adaptable policy into them. So they can say, look, if, this, if these conditions are in place, our policy will be this. If these conditions are in place, our policy will be this. So that you can explore during the planning process different scenarios for what might come at you and build policies that can fit within either of those. The other thing you can obviously do is, is things like a climate adaptation plan where you actually look quite carefully at what's likely to come at you and identify specific ways that you can adapt and, and mitigate the risks that, that you can identify through those. So both of those, I think, can address that question. Who's number two, please? Yes. What happens, in, as in the case of the City of North Vancouver, when you've done all the engagement, the staff has done all the work, and you ultimately don't get the backing of your City Council? Do you go back to the drawing board? Um, 
Uh, this is directed to you, Patrick. Are, will you be yeah, I mean, involved in that? A couple things to say. One, yeah, you absolutely have to have councils backing both to initiate the process, which in the city of North Vancouver they did. Uh, you know, uh, an enduring staff. Richard White was there and had been for 15 to 20 years and had the political uh, capacity to uh, understand what the value of this was and how it supported uh, the, the discussions at the council level. So it worked in their interest to give credence and to visualize what they've been trying to articulate in the absence of pictures. Uh, and if you look at the track record of the existing council in the city of North Vancouver, they've done pretty well. Uh, their recent election was not without debates about high rises and density and so forth, but they survived and that 100 year plan has become the basis for two different official community plan updates now. And you know, pertinent to what uh, Peter was just saying, uh, th that was a 50 year plan and nobody expects it to be followed 50 years from now but what, what I argue is it tells you what to do Monday. You know, it gives, a 50-year plan is really good at telling you what you ought to do Monday. Now, should I widen that sidewalk? Or, you know, what about this project? How does this relate to a long-term vision? Of course, it's going to change significantly, and you could do a 50-year plan every 10 years if you wanted to. But I think, particularly in our time, where we're all trying to create a sustainable city for our kids, and that takes... 50 years to execute because cities change so slowly. That's the real value of it. In response to your question about the role of the politician, when I go elsewhere in the world, because a lot of people are interested in how did Vancouver turn from what it was in the 50s and 60s, which I would say was an unspectacular city in a spectacular setting, and then 30, 40 years later, we're suddenly one of the most livable cities in the world. And I always start off by saying the whole process started and was carried because city councils over the years had had visions and wanted to see those visions happen and engage the community in many of those visions. And so I always start, if you don't have the political support to start, why even start your planning process? I started, I was part of a planning process called the Vancouver Plan in about the late 1980s. And it was one staff really felt we needed a citywide plan. And the council kind of said, yawn, go ahead. And we did it. It was received by council. Council said, yawn. And it went on the, you know, on the shelf. It wasn't until later the council got so frustrated by what was happening in every time staff and council proposed a new development that it was getting opposition that then council said, and I still remember Gordon Campbell taking his shoe off, banging it on the desk and saying, <laughs> let the public walk in our shoes. And so to me, it's the uh, public engagement and to the question about uh, resiliency. We can't anticipate everything that's going to happen, but if you have a very knowledgeable, engaged public, when some major issue happens, you've got the ideas of the whole community to call on. That was number three. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? That uh, four, was, and then was number three. three. Sorry, number two, number three then. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in that public engagement process and how uh, a large citywide plan would, um, how different neighborhoods would interact with each other. Um, one of the things we've seen with the Grandview Woodland local area plan right now is that um, some of the, the objections that came up from residents was, OK, if I'm being asked to take on more density, am I being asked to take on more than my share versus other neighborhoods? And uh, another issue that has come up is the issue of um, we don't have as many parks as other neighborhoods. This is, uh, again, an, an inter-neighborhood equity issue. Um, so I, I can see how a, a large citywide plan would help with that, because then you could help to, to map out you know, who's getting what density and, and that issue of fairness. But on the other hand, I look at the, the plan that just went through in the downtown east side and how that puts, put the brakes on development to a certain extent and put a lot of emphasis on not having displacement. And I wonder if the, if the entire city was doing a plan at the same time, if the emphasis on the needs of people in local communities, especially that didn't have political capital, 
would be less. And if, if a group like the Downtown East Side or other groups that didn't have as much political influence would get railroaded by the aspirations of other parts of the city that displace misery or, or, or undesirable things towards those areas that, that um, can't resist them. So, so I, I'm just interested in that inter-neighborhood dynamics and even how you would go about the public participation to create a healthy process. Uh, maybe one day you can, you can give a talk on city plan. But the notion there was to engage people from all communities thinking about the city first. And just to very quickly comment on how you engage people who aren't normally part of a political process. Mm -hmm. One is translation. City plan ran in six written languages and eight spoken languages. It brought a whole new um, community to the table. Secondly, in areas like the downtown east side, are people necessarily able to write sort of academic pieces or pieces about their neighborhood? No. But we certainly had staff sitting down with people and talking to them and then writing up the material on their behalf. I think that you need the broad city-wide discussion to set a context. And this is one of the things I wonder about some of the plans now that seem to be just happening. But are they going to be taking their share? And just as an example of how you look at the take share idea, during the city plan visions process, a neighborhood would be doing a plan using the broad context that had been approved through city plan. And the neighborhood would be very engaged. But we also had a group called the City Perspectives Panel. Anybody ever heard of the City Perspectives Panel? Mm -hmm. They were a group of people from other neighborhoods around where that plan was being done. And they were invited by council to watch what was happening in that neighborhood. And if that neighborhood was busy saying, well, everybody else can take more density, but not us. Everyone else can take recycling center, but not us those citizens from other neighborhoods were there to say, excuse me, if you don't take a share, what happens in our neighborhood? So I think neighbor to neighbor can also be part of a process to make sure that the issues and interests of all are involved, not just each neighborhood mm -hmm. on its own time. And I'll add one thing to that. Having done this, not in Vancouver, with the authorization of the Vancouver city, but in many of the surrounding cities, over 20 times, we have never found a case where if you frame the question correctly, people will operate from their, self, their selfish interests. It's, it's a matter of setting the goal, what kind of city do you want? Where do you want your kids to live? Do you want them safe? Do you want it to be affordable? Do you want you know ways to get around other than the car? Uh, do you want uh, natural resources protected? The answer to that is always yes, yes, yes. Because, you know, people really are the same on that one. It's when we get mired down in the mock of, well, I don't want that next door to me, or as you say, this neighborhood's not taking its share, that it goes off the rails. So my experience, which I'd share with the people in this room, is I think city plan did this, except they didn't come up with a plan at the end of it for the, for the whole city as a map. Uh, my advice is start with the discussion of what do you want your city to be like? What is your main goal? What are your objectives on the way to that goal? Formalize that agreement. And then execute a planning process that would come up very quickly with a plan. I mean, the word charrette is bandied around uh, often incorrectly. But I don't think it's inconceivable to, at a certain point in this process, have a citywide charrette with 20 different tables around the city, organized around their own, their own geographic area, but connected and exhibited as a plan for the whole city at one time. I think it's actually totally doable. The only caution I would have, and a number of years ago, the Vancouver City Planning Commission, who are hosting today, did something called the Goals for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And that was a creative look at everything people would like about their city. The difficulty in trying to implement it was that it never engaged people in the tough choices. Mm -hmm. And so we had developers standing there with the Goals for Vancouver, waving them and saying, it says we want to add housing in the neighborhood. And the same material on the same page, the community was saying, it says in this one, don't change the character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So you do at some stage really have to get to some of those tough choices, whether it's limited land or limited money, 
and how that, those choices are going to be made becomes a basis often for then having to make some tough choices. And I, I just want to interject because I'm getting excited. I argue, that, <laughs> I argue that it's the drawing, the actual drawing, that resolves those contradictions. Because when you actually put new buildings on the ground, actually take away somebody's house, actually change things, actually have a new street where there wasn't one before, you know, those are where those contradictions become obvious. And you can't avoid them when you're doing the drawing. That's why the drawing is so crucial. Accepting, remember, how big is the city of North Vancouver? I said 20 tables, not one. Well, <laughs> 20 tables might be 20 of this group in the room. There's over a million people use the city I of think, Vancouver every I day. Think, so. I think you can do it. I maintain yeah. you can do it. Okay. <laughs> We've got 20 minutes left, number four, number Oops. five, <laughs> and then everybody <laughs> raise their hands. Okay, six, uh, sorry, six down here. <laughs> Six, seven, okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, and uh, my name is William Gibbons. What really brought me here today was the announcement that you were going to talk about the plan from, I think, 1929 for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was kind of ironic um, because uh, two of your presenters had mentioned uh, the Surrey plan, current Central City plan. So I have a two part question. First of all, Michael Alexander is director of the City Compensations Program. I want to ask you if you'd invite me to give a presentation on the same basis as these bigwigs from the city. We can talk about that on, later. On Thank you. my research, funded by Metro, TransLink, City of Surrey, and SFU. We can talk on about that later, the please. Historic Stick city to this one, or please. Map. I'd like to claim extra time because I've been refused the right to present to the Mayor of the Round Table, also by UBC. We don't and have extra time here. Here. So I'm placing a challenge on you to put your money where your mouth is, just like I'm prepared to do. Ah, for our speakers. Can we get back to this? this yeah, we get back yeah. to the <laughs> Let me just interrupt. Please, no, no. So please, back to our speakers and on your uh, oh, mention of the City of Surrey's current plan for Central Surrey. The 1910-12 plan for Port Metro is actually out of the picture, and it's very significant because the plan for Port Man is intimately tied to the history of Vancouver, in particular because it was one of DC's first major alleged real estate fraud cases, and that is tied to the switching of the railway terminals from Port Man to Vancouver. Not on license play, but a Broadway subway, which Mr. Robertson is trying to pull off. And so we're faced with many regional issues. So my question for our speakers today is, remember in news reports recently have talked about conflicts with people wanting a mega city or not. Regional city centers managed by the people that live there are a mega metro region. And speaking as someone that ran in the 2011 provincial by-election in Vancouver Point Grey, and ran in the provincial election Let's get to the Can we get to the to say on whether we need a mega city in this region, or whether we need regional city cities that are more sensitive to the people that live there. Next question. Next, Next question. question. Oh, no answer. No to a mega city. I've worked in enough mega cities. Uh, I think that while we have warts in our system here, there's a lot bigger warts when you talk to people from Toronto about the challenges they've had trying to bring everything together. And so I think that what we have here, consensus is often difficult, but yet I think we recognized internationally for having done some great things through consensual processes as opposed to through forced amalgamation processes. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. How about you, Mr. I'd like to delve, delve into the process part of how we get to the citywide plan. Peter talked about a vision being essential and acknowledging that we might not resolve all of the conflicts that exist in that vision. And Anne talked about building on the vision statements that are out there. And I'd like to know how we would move from interpretation by some neighborhoods of those vision statements being regulatory documents that govern their principality, if you want to call it that, and, and translating that into what Patrick talks about as a more aspirational for the city-wide um, 
future that we look at, how do we get back down to putting on paper then what is distilled from the, that direction of those visions? Well, you know, I'll, I can give a quick response to that, hopefully a provocative one. I think city plan is a good, you know, basis. Take it the next step. The next step is to do a drawing of the city as we expect it to be 50 years from now. Use that as a basis for a new zoning map and a new set of policies. Get away from funding the city's capital improvement budget with CACs. Use DCL because you accurately identify how many libraries the city needs, how many swimming pools, where they might best be. Uh, that would be my that would be my uh, recommendation. So you'd say scrap the vision statements that exist today. I might not do that. Entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I think there's a tremendous amount of power and effort and many many voices that are in the community visions documents, um, as well as in, in city plan, which to me reads much more like a, a vision statement, if you like, set of goals and objectives for the city. And when I think about a vision for a, for a city, I think about something that's fairly short, frankly. You can maybe you can't leave it in your head, but a couple of pages at most is, is, is what you can deal with. But how do you translate that down into uh, something that's real on the ground is, is the crux of the matter. I think Patrick's approach is, is an interesting one, and it's a helpful one. Um, in Prince George, we used to, an approach that's not dissimilar, but instead of just taking growth and uh, the shape and pattern of development, we also asked the question, we essentially set up a set of tw about 20 goal statements, um, made some either qualitative or even quantitative assessments of how different city patterns would uh, affect each of those goals. And we brought them back to the public and said, look, there is development pattern. If you continue as a status quo with your existing regulations, here's what it looks like, here's how it performs. We did what three other patterns. It resulted in a shift from 80% greenfield development to 80% infill development at a policy level. It's tremendous, huge change. That, that was the first part of the conversation I talked about earlier. The second part of the conversation is, okay, well, we put a big dot around this neighborhood center and a lightly shaded area around that. Well, now what does that look like? Is that two stories? Is it four stories? Is it a strip mall right now? Well, how are we actually going to get a strip mall to shift to another type of development? If it's successful, it's going to be six or eight stories, maybe, depending on land value. So how do you then have that conversation and bring in some of those real considerations to the community and say, look, uh, it would be really nice to replace a strip mall with a two-story apartment building and a couple of retail stores, of but it's not going to work. So what will work? Well, here's three or four forms that will work. Let's have that conversation with the real information in front of us and give people an understanding of those trade-offs and help the community walk through those difficult choices, illustrated in ways that they understand. I'd certainly love focus on the piece of the community visions, which physically identified where a neighborhood center was going to be. And then, much like in Knight and Kingsway, go in and work with the community using, as I mentioned, a set of existing, a menu of existing <coughs> schedules. It took quite a while, it took about 14 months to do Knight and Kingsway, and a lot of that was inventing new zoning schedules which would fit into the community. Most of those schedules are there now. We can see what they look like when they're built because building's happening. I would take that menu of schedules, I would locate it where basically the community said they wanted to see the centers, and then work on exactly what the zoning's going to be and get the zoning in place. I think we actually, in retrospect, spent too long on the broad community vision and too little time getting it drilled down to the next level, which is the zoning level. Mm. I, that's, that's, yeah. I think we agree on that. But I would, I would just say that don't start from scratch. I would be going out and saying to the community, you know, you have had these discussions in the past, you've had these areas that you're thinking might be your community center. We'd like to see it happen. Let me give you a good example if you pretend the past never happened. We saw what happened on Point Grey Road. You know something, if you look back an urban landscape task force in the early 1990s did a greenways map for the city. And part of that greenway was going along Point Grey Road. 
I, if I was counsel, might have said, you know, the community was really supportive of the Greenways map, a Greenways plan. We now have the funding to proceed with the piece that was going to go along the waterfront there. We're going to move on that, as opposed to pretending it came from nowhere mm -hmm. and it was the impersonal invention. And so I think that in many cases, if you can engage people from the past and bring them into the future, better than pretending nothing has happened. Dunbar was a little tougher to do. Dunbar is the toughest. <laughs> Number six. Um, when talking about citywide plans, I've seen a lot of different kinds of citywide plans, and I've seen the kind that Patrick's been talking about, which seems to have a drawing of the whole thing, and I've seen the kind that Anne has, uh, has created the city plan in Vancouver, which is more a set of principles and concepts. Um, and in both of those, what troubles me is that they seem to be obsolete almost as soon as they're published. And the question that I've been struggling with in other contexts is how, how do we deal with that? And recently I've come upon a, a thought with some other people's thinking, not mine, that seems to maybe be a way to do this, and I would like to ask the panelists to comment on it. And that is, rather than publish a plan, a citywide plan, which I think should be more like Anne suggested and less like Patrick suggested, it should be more conceptual. Maybe it's a place. Maybe it's a process. Maybe it is a, something where citizens are constantly engaging in that vision of their city that is, that is really documented in a three-dimensional place. might have a model. It might have, uh, it might have music. It might have many other kinds of ways to document that. And, and, and once a year is confirmed to be the vision of the place. And it just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, and then leave the drawings to the specifics of neighborhoods and communities and, and, and that. And I just wondered uh, what the three panelists might think about this. You see, I think that with the social networks that we have now and the speed of communication we have now and the speed with which we change our opinions that we have now, that to publish a plan and say it's from now to 2050 is, is becoming less and less relevant every day. Mm -hmm. I respectfully disagree. <laughs> I think that the drawing is fundamental as the access way for citizens to understand what they're buying into and to be able to engage in a policy discussion without glossing over the contradictions between you know, housing affordability, transportation, desirability of new green systems, because the drawing has to resolve those contradictions. You could do Wait that a in a place, though. Excuse me, just a minute. Having said that, however, I don't think that the drawing is a, is a fixed document. It can be an organic document that grows into the future. I think it would behoove us, though, to use a drawing or a series of drawings to at least, if nothing else, update the zoning map and to have a citywide document that that relates to, uh, valid if not forever, for five or 10 years. And then my final comment, without wanting to take the floor for too long, I really think starting with an objective of 50 years in the future is a necessary precondition for understanding where you want to go. Cities take that long to get built. And again, I'll repeat it, it tells you what to do Monday. It also gives the citizens something much more uh, robust than a policy paragraph about what's going to happen in their neighborhood or what they have collectively decided. They can say, well, what you're proposing with that 40-story tower next to this Broadway subway station uh, does not look at all like I thought we were going to get. So can I jump in on that one quickly? Um, I, I've been a big fan of the idea of small plans with enabling systems for implementation and really invest in resources in implementation. I'm intrigued by the idea of having a plan sort of in a place, and it could be in a digital place as well. Um, and I'd argue that it, you could draw policies from the various panoply of plans that Anne showed and, pull them together to a place that captures them and makes them easily accessible to people. I happen to like the visual representations. Um, but if you think of a, of a plan, I talked about planning as making decisions for the future. And we're doing that daily. So a plan, to think about a plan as, as a thing that lands in 2015 and then doesn't get changed in 2025 is crazy. 
uh, we actually need to think of plans and planning as being top of living documents, where we literally need to think of them that way and maybe actually create them and maintain them that way. And maybe that's a bit more what you're talking about. There's a lot of space for diagrams and images to say that's what this plan looks like here or here. Um, but I love that idea. Um, so for me, it's about a small plan as a document that captures that guiding direction, the policies, the vision, and that's then built on over time and adjusted over time with diagrams, new policies, new directions, experiments, whatever it might be. Yeah. Thank you. Time's getting short. Number six, number seven. Yeah. Uh, number eight. seven. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Number sorry. seven, sorry. number eight. Sorry. <laughs> I joined the city in 93, and I think the city plan is uh, maybe a year or so underway by then. Uh, and when the then, then director of planning, Tom Fletcher, took me over to the city plan group's office in City Square, I was looking at what they were doing and asked a basic question, uh, which is what Peter said at the beginning was a plan for. And, he's, and I asked, is, well, this is for a comedy growth. And the then senior planner involved with that said, no, it's not about growth. I, I, I couldn't conceptualize uh, planning for the future that didn't accommodate that. And his answer was, it's about change, whatever that is, the maturing neighborhoods, the turnover, the change of one group of generations for another, I guess, but not necessarily to accommodate more people, which is a sort of a shocking thing in today's life where we know we have to accommodate more people. So uh, one of the values I see for a citywide plan is that it's a structuring document. Uh, and I use uh, the District of North Van, which has a very simple diagram of the nodes and corridors. You know where the town centers and building centers are. It didn't obviate or eliminate the need for two more years in each one of those centers to go through landing it on the ground. And Patrick was involved in one in Portland and Valley. But all that work was probably circa 2007. We're just now implementing with our first developments seven years later. So uh, you still need to drill down, but that diagram is understood by everybody in the community. They know what centers are, they know the boundaries of those centers. They know, generally speaking, what can go on there, and there's even a number attached to how many people or how many units could be accommodate there. So I think some kind of conceptual notion with numbers as well as imagery, and a diagrammatic thing, which may be Peter's very short plan embellished with enough document, you know, low versus high and what the land uses is sort of an interesting tool. As long as you can maintain that notion, we don't have that in the city of Vancouver. We don't have an overall armature for how centers can grow. We don't have a hierarchy of centers. It was capacity-driven, so not how the demand is accommodated. Okay. And the only, thing I would, minutes. the only thing I would add to that is that I also worry about what the priorities were for community services. Because mm -hmm. my impression has always been that if people have change and more density, that like to see something in return. Number seven, thank you. Hi, I'd like to just uh, follow up on one of the earlier questions. This uh, question is directed at uh, Patrick. Uh, in terms of social resiliency, because what we are talking about is livability in, in a plant, what role do you think the public realm and urban design uh, play in terms of social resiliency in the time of climate change and perhaps peak oil? Well, in a minute and a half left. <laughs> you want to try to get one more question, catch a question in. No, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm an urban designer. I call myself, I'm leading that group, so I think it's important. I think the drawing is a way to resolve some of those issues at the same time you're dealing with affordability, transportation. I think it's in the drawing. I wanted to pick up on what Larry said, because I was thinking the same thing. As a city planner who's done a lot of city plans, including uh, the most recent city in North Vancouver, OCP, which benefited greatly from Patrick's work and the work of DCS and the idea of the 100 year plan, I started to think maybe, why do we fixate on the plan? Recognize that we're constantly planning, we're constantly making decision making, and how do we set up a framework in the city so that we're constant, you know, that we can have these conversations, and maybe they're smaller in scale on some issues, bigger in scale on bigger issues that do require investments and big pictures. And maybe, maybe as much as I do believe that trending and drawing has to be part of the process, can we get off the form of development question to the model of development and questions of how we develop and what kind of relationships are involved between communities and the city and other stakeholders as we move forward. So my, just, my question is, do we really need a plan? 
And my answer is yes. And, and, <laughs> and I want to go back to Frank's comment that we don't even have a diagram for the center. We don't have a diagram. We do, diagram. though. Not we really, really do. do. Yeah. Not in, a, in a regional context statement, you call that a diagram. I mean, that's not really a diagram. And I think that the official community plans of Surrey or North Vancouver and all of those, their, their fundamental land use map is pretty much a diagram to which a lot of other things are connected and attached. And again, it's my feeling, strongly felt and strongly delivered, that we don't have it. <laughs> and we need that. Okay. It's 1.30. I'm sorry we don't have time for uh, more questions. Uh, thanks to the uh, Vancouver uh, City Planning Commission. If you want to follow more information on this, go to this website. Go to this website, and there is lots of well organized information. One moment, please. One moment, please. First of all, we want to thank our presenters. I want to thank the Vancouver City Planning Commission with, uh, for their assistance in putting uh, this program together today. Uh, we, want to thank, we want to thank our sponsors, SFU uh, Public Square, Bing Tom Architects, the city program, uh, and thank you all. Our next conversation, this is our last conversation for 2014. We're going to take a break in December because nobody will show up in December and we're going to take a break for the first Thursday in January because that's January 1st and I don't think you want to be here on New Year's Day. But we will be back on January 15th. We'll send you, if you haven't signed up, please put your uh, name and email on our sign-up sheets, which are, are around here. And we will let you know a week or more in advance of what the topic will be. You are all invited to this public uh, event. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for helping to make this our most successful city conversation. Here.